Hello, everyone. Welcome to the keynote session of Soil School. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful spring evening. If you're in Portland, it's quite lovely outside. Uh, I'm Renee Magyar with West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, and I'm co-hosting tonight with my colleague, Cami kern Karat, also with West Multnomah. Um, we're hosting the Soil School series with our partner, Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, West Multnomah's mission is to provide resources, information, and expertise to inspire people to actively improve air and water quality, fish and wildlife habitat, and soil health. We serve residents of Western Multnomah County, Soviet Island, and a portion of the Bonnie Slope neighborhood with conservation planning, weed management, native plants, wildlife habitat restoration, and school gardens. Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District's mission is to create a sustainable, productive, and healthy environment for the Washington County, Oregon community. They serve residents of the county by providing educational opportunities, advice about natural resource conservation, and financial assistance for conservation projects. Um, and now before we begin, begin this evening, it's important we acknowledge the original indigenous people whose land we are utilizing today, the Clackamas Chinook, the Willamette Tumwater, the Wasco Wishram, the Watlada, the Multnomah, and other Shinnipin peoples, as well as the Tualatin Kalapuya, the Cayuse, the Malala, the Yakima, and other tribes and bands of the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. It is important to acknowledge these original inhabitants of the land that falls within our service areas, now known as the City of Portland, Soviet Island, and the Tualatin Mountains. We further recognize that we are here because of the land displacement, cultural erasure, and other sacrifices that were forced upon them. We also remind ourselves that we're guests of this land and must do our best to honor the original peoples through authentic cultural narratives and continued caring of and giving to the air, water, plants, animals, and the ecosystems that make up this land community. To follow this acknowledgement with action, we will pursue impactful partnerships with indigenous people, tribes, and their sovereign governments and intertribal organizations. Okay, so now I have a few housekeeping tips for you. Uh, we're recording all of the sessions and they will be available on Tualatin's YouTube channel a week after the session. Uh, look for links on the event registration page. Uh, tonight's presentation will go until 7.15 and we will have 15 minutes after that for Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, um, please enter it into the Q&A window, not into the chat. And if you see a question that you like in the Q&A window, you can upload it by clicking the thumbs up icon in that window. Now, I'm very honored to introduce our keynote speaker. Judy Bluehorse Skelton is an assistant professor in the Indigenous Nations Studies Department at Portland State University, where she teaches Indigenous ecological healing practices contemporary issues in Indian country, indigenous women leadership, and indigenous gardens and food justice. She's worked with federal, state, and local native organizations and tribes throughout the Northwest for more than 25 years, conducting cultural activities focusing on traditional and contemporary uses of native plants for food, medicine, ceremony, and healthy life ways. In 2017, she received the PSU President's Diversity Award and in 2014, the in Oregon Indian Education Association's Award for Outstanding Indian Educator. Her collaborative work includes the Confederated Tribes of Select Indians, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, the Native American Rehabilitation Association, the Native American Community Advisory Council, Portland Parks and Recreation, Metro, City of Portland Bureau of Environmental Services, and US Fish and Wildlife Service integrating indigenous land practices with indigenous traditional ecological, ecological and cultural knowledge to address food sovereignty, justice, and reclaim the urban forest for physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Please welcome Judy Bluehurst Skelton. It's an honor to be invited here this evening. Tots may we, hello. Um, I appreciate um, our time together and that folks have taken their evening time on a beautiful evening in Portland to, uh, to Zoom tonight. And so um, I'm just grateful to everyone. I'm grateful to the ancestors who have, uh, uh, who could see what I could not see when they were planning the times we were in and we are in today. 
And so, and I want to um, thank my colleague and dear friend, Gabe Shushups, for helping to craft the land acknowledgement that was shared tonight. It's so important. And um, it's a reminder that um, all of this land is indigenous land and we're at a very exciting time of um, reconciliation, reconnecting, refreshment, resurgence and renewal. And so I had a, a few slides to share tonight about the work that we all are doing in uh, reclaiming our urban forests and our urban landscapes for food, medicine, ceremony, healthy life ways. And this evening I'd like to share um, an overview of some of the indigenous cultural collaborations we're uh, we've been up to in the Portland metro area. I love this slide. Um, it reminds uh, everyone that um, we are still here. Um, even though we might have left physically, we have never left emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And we are back. Um, I also find this slide, which is actually in the collection of the Portland Art Museum. It's a very small beaded piece of artwork by indigenous artist, Marcus Ammerman from the 1990s. And I just love the skyline um, continued to be shad overshadowed by our big, big, big relative, Mount Hood and uh, what some call Wayist and others have many different names in our indigenous languages along Nichiwana, the big river, some call the Columbia. And so I always love starting with this. And uh, I always like to also start, especially when we get into plant people, like I think many of you are this evening, what does it mean to be indigenous to a place? Um, I think if we were conversational and when I'm with students, um, and I share this slide, it's kind of part of their um, sense of identity and sense of place. Where is this? Do you recognize this place? It has changed a lot because of all the dams on Michiwana, on the big river, the Columbia. But in many ways, um, when uh, I shared this slide um, with my dad, this is from an old Nez Perce calendar. I didn't do a formal introduction, but I am Nimi Pu, or Nez Perce and Cherokee. And I've lived in this region for, uh, I've lived in the West all of my life. And my dad remembers coming through the Columbia uh, River Gorge when they were building, let's see, the visitor center here. And um, on the old highway, it would take them two days to get from Idaho over to Portland to visit family. And so he remembers the river before the Salido Falls were gone and the dams happened there. And so uh, I also love this slide and as plant people that you all are and soil people um, in the foreground, you'll recognize a non-native, but it's my dad's favorite flower and we can't interact. And I would say, does anyone identify that? But it's a sweet pea. And it's sweet pea, which is naturalized here. And it's growing in amongst a lot of natives. And it's in our Nez Perce calendar from back in the day. And um, I like to remind us all that, um, like many relationships, we have tried to incorporate the best of one another's into our understanding, our history and our culture. And when I think of how my dad loves the sweet pea, I'm reminded that, okay, right? You're not throwing everything out. We have a relationship. And, and so that's what we're looking at here. So we can all ask ourselves, what does it mean to be indigenous to a place? Another question I often uh, will ask students and um, conferences and, and uh, communities like we're gathered tonight, how does the land inform who we are? 
I would normally say, okay, this is part of your uh, midterm. Can anyone identify this place? The big clue is it's in this first calendar, <laughs> but that isn't always a clue for people that don't know the history of place and of indigenous people. Um, but this is Wallawa Lake and um, in Eastern Oregon. And oftentimes part of the um, understanding we want to share with folks is for us, this lake is sacred. We do not get in the lake. We do not recreate on the lake. We, um, we, it has its own stories and it has its own uh, identity. And so um, it's a reminder that often when we're doing work, whether it's in city hall or whether it's in the Metro um, planning office or whether it's with US Fish and Wildlife or any of our other partners or where we're invited to serve on a, um, uh, an advisory for climate change or an advisory for um, um, planning on land use. Um, we're reminded that the big partner who is not in the room, but should be and cannot speak for itself, are these places. And they're ultimately determining how we will live here in a good way. They always have. And so um, it is part of our responsibility as Indigenous people when we're in the conference room or the classroom or um, in the business, we're reminding our communities that they ha we have to consider what the land is informing us to do. And um, when we don't listen to that, when we forget our original instructions and who these big entities are, um, then we can get into trouble pretty fast. <laughs> and so we can look at climate change or climate chaos, or we can look at um, colonizing models that have brought us to this precipice of dramatic climate change where uh, an industrialized um, approach to um, the earth, not as relative like natural relatives, but natural resources. And you can see where we quickly forget that we are interdependent and we also have an obligation to the land, a responsibility to the land, whether we talk about Tamanawit uh, as uh, Columbia River folks, Tamanawit is our natural law. It implies, it requires so much more than what the English language, I can't think what, but it's an interdependent reciprocal relationship that guides our behavior. It guides our practices. It guides and informs our identity and it guides and it informs our uh, future generations. When we are in, uh, when we are in sync with and following Tamanawit, that natural law, we can live the good life. Yeah, there's tough times, but we can live the good life. We're not, we're having some hard times now. And a lot of that has gotten disrupted with the arrival of uh, um, European practices with the land colonization and industrialization. I always like to share this information. Um, I don't wanna to be too heavy, um, but it's a heavy history. You have to be heavy. It's not a lightweight story. And so the doctrine of discovery, I think anyone working in, um, in land-based nonprofits in land-based departments, whether it's fish and wildlife or city or regional governments or state governments. I think all institutions, universities have to be familiar with the doctrine of discovery. And I'll just do a quick, I've included um, links here, but the doctrine of discovery um, is basically the papal law put out by the Pope in 1493 that all land discovered by explorers 
which we don't use any of those words anymore, <laughs> Indigenous Nations Studies, or hopefully you're not either. We look at exploitation, invasion. If we're going to be in love with the land, if we're working to restore land, if we're working to plant plants, as you all are, if you're working to work with communities to clean up or restore or build gardens, um, <clears throat> We have to understand how we got here. And the doctrine of discovery is fairly straightforward. The papal bull said in 1493, interesting date, right? That all land discovered, unless the people are Christians, they have no entitlement to the land. No title, which means deed, money, they are just an occupant, the way a rabbit is, the way a deer is, the way a cedar tree is. They have, no, they have no title, they have no right to the land. So you can see that's a pretty tricky thing for indigenous people, whether you're looking at Australia or South, what we call South America today, or we look um, uh, right here in what's called the United States today. And that was the first thing. It's still on the books. Uh, there have been different groups advocating to um, get that off, to meet with the Pope. They've refused to meet with indigenous communities to uh, rescind that papal bull. The second one is Manifest Destiny. I think most folks are familiar with that. And um, that's um, a uniquely, uh, that's driven by that, man has the right to dominate and to make the earth in his own fashion, which um, is, uh, again, a relationship that's hierarchical. It uh, does not respect the fact that we are interdependent, that we have a relationship. Um, it's um, something that gave the US government the right to um, create policy and practices that um, were not in the best interest of um, people or plants or any of our um, uh, other animal, insect, bird, fish relatives. And um, that's still often uh, a, uh, it's still often in our culture, in our society as a whole, and can often be guiding practices. Um, I'll just touch removal and ceded lands as Renee began with the land acknowledgement. Removal is the forced removal of indigenous people from their homelands. Ceded is a very passive land, uh, word that we are uh, redefining. Um, basically, we didn't have a choice to seed land or give land away. It was either you do this or perish. And so we are on lots, everything is seeded land. Uh, there are some, um, important to know, there are some uh, indigenous tribal communities between Canada and the US today who never agreed. And they're having some really um, exciting conversations now with their governments especially as sovereign nations, going to the next sovereignty, um, the right to self-determination, the right to self-governance, um, sovereignty, tribal uh, communities in the United States, tribal um, people are called out in the constitution. And so um, that recognition is unique. It's why we use the term BIPOC, black indigenous people of color we recognize that as indigenous people, we are not so much an ethnic group as we are sovereign nations. And with our government to government relationships, we have been able to, um, in order to survive, we have been able to develop uh, an understanding that allows us access to land. And as we move into treaties and federal recognition, treaties are our, um, such as they are, they're not uniform. In the Northwest, you're looking at the treaties of 1855 between Idaho, Canada, um, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington for the most part. Um, and it has to do with our rights to hunt, fish, pick, 
our foods, dig roots and gather on our usual and accustomed places. This is really important for everyone on this kind of webinar to understand that even though we are not on our actual reservation, if you think of Warm Springs, Warm Springs Reservation that we think of in Central Oregon has its usual and accustomed places, which include around Mount Jefferson, they include right here in Portland along the Willamette Falls when they're gathering eel. Um, and that's true for um, Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission uh, Nest Purse. We're considered an Idaho tribe, but this is our usual and accustomed place for fishing, gathering, digging camas. Um, Yakima, people think of Washington tribe, but they also have treaty rights on the Columbia and Willamette Rivers, and so does the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla. So a little background, we can look at relocation. Why there's over 280 different tribes here in, in Portland, that's because relocation was a policy in the 50s to um, force uh, indigenous communities off their homelands and go into these big cities for jobs. It was like a one-way bus ticket. And that's Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Sacramento. And that's why you have such diversity. And then termination is just what it sounds like also in the 50s where many of the Oregon tribes were terminated by the federal government and ceased to be recognized as indigenous people. They lost all their land. That was a land grab for their forests. If you look at the tribes that were terminated, they are forest and ocean people. And so in, in the state of Oregon, we had more terminations than any other state. Restoration is exciting. 70s and 80s, those same tribes have been restored thanks to their own hard work. And we are in a period of reclamation and resurgence right now. Just gonna let you read this, who we are. Because of relocation, because of our treaties of 1855, Portland has a fairly robust Native American population. We have a lot of tribal and native organizations headquartered here because of that. This confluence of the Willamette and Columbia rivers, it's always where we've been gathering since time immemorial and we continue to be a place where we gather. Another little important note at the bottom, uh, as of July 2012, the city of Portland, unique. You don't usually have a government-to-government -government relationship between tribes and a city, but this was the first a resolution to collaborate with the six tribes on whose land uh, of 1855 um, Portland can sit. And I was there that day in City Hall back then when the six tribal chairs gathered with the mayor at the time and the commissioners, it was Mayor Sam Adams and um, these treaties, these um, resolution was read and each of the tribal chairs um, spoke beautifully to that. The recording is actually archived at the city of Portland's um, city hall's archives if you want to check that out. These for folks who don't know um, the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon and everyone has a um, website. I suggest if you're looking to um, understand more about this place we call Oregon um, please check them out. Um, uh, tribes have decided what they're gonna share, whether it's an origin story, whether it's plant uh, relationships, restoration projects. For Nez Perce, we have our, we're not an Oregon tribe, so we're not on here. But it's important to know that Yakima and Nez Perce are part of who is um, informing um, decision-making on the Columbia and Willamette tribes. Guiding values, uh, I'd like to include this. It's also important. Um, remembering our responsibility to the seventh generation. These are some of the things I have put together, together over the many years. I won't read them all. A lot of res responsibility, a lot of RE words.
cultivating healthy relationships, living, planning, designing, and managing for the seventh generation. I'm so used to going, are there any questions? Taking a little break, but let's, we'll, we'll hold those for uh, afterwards. Getting outside, this is Tryon Creek State Park with um, uh, our Portland Public Schools Indian Education Office, which is still around. It's a federal program to uh, support our um, native students K through 12 and their families in the public school system. And so these are often opportunities for all of you to um, be aware that part of our education system, this was a summer program on art, culture, and the sciences. Those all are come together into one. And so the students are getting out and um, uh, second through fifth grade. Um, I wanted to include this as well. Um, I won't read all of this. We, we do presentations on the work we're doing in indigenous traditional ecological and cultural knowledge. Um, heal the land, heal the people. This was a presentation PSU students and I did at University of Washington. Recognizes the role of indigenous ways of knowing and um, represents new partnership in education and ran, land reclamation. Uh, utilizing indigenous cultural practices, sustainability models. Um, utilizes indigenous traditional knowledge to restore land on behalf of regional native flora and to deepen understanding, knowledge and engagement through seasonal harvest, tending and educational workshops. I wanted to highlight that more and more of the programming we're doing with partners, government partners and others is creating seasonal rounds, what we would call seasonal rounds to access the land that uh, is being managed, whether it's by soil and water district, whether it's by Metro, whether it's by Portland Parks or the Bureau of Environmental Services or US Fish and Wildlife on their national wildlife refuges. Um, we are um, bringing this seasonal practice to part of their staff and how they're managing and how we access land. Uh, demonstrates our broader capacity building implications of indigenous tech or what we're adding into the full ecological and cultural on long-term land restoration and management practices. And so we look at this um, as part of environmental social uh, justice um, and so much more. I'm so used to stopping and saying any questions, but we'll wait. This is just a, one way to present um, our partners and supporters. You can see the different kinds of organizations, um, how they come together and uh, forming these partnerships and relationships over the long term. Principles guiding interaction. This um, is just one of about eight bubbles of guidelines through community engagement with the indigenous community over the last 10 years. I'm just sharing one tonight. And these are how we, um, through um, community engagement and hosting um, those conversations, either through the Portland Youth and Elders Council, through our Native American Community Advisory Council, which meets every month, um, hosting lunches at the Native American Student and Community Center at Portland State um, and other venues. Um, these help guide the work. They're not all we're doing, but I think um, it helps center the work that we're doing. Um, then I've got a few um, sites, just the NACAC, Native American Community Advisory Council to Portland Parks and Metro. We now have BES and US Fish and Wildlife and many other agencies that come to our monthly meetings. And through that, um, we are being able to connect right away on um, 
field sites and projects that we are doing with these different partners. They learn from one another, they learn from what the community is doing, um, how to um, form those relationships, um, how to disrupt what we would call the settler narrative or this kind of um, settler mythology. When we're in Oregon, we can think of the Oregon Trail and all the mythology that has been built around that. Uh, a lot of this is getting dismantled through projects like Metro and indigenous communities work on Willamette Falls. Uh, now that the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde has purchased that site, um, we have to uh, remember and recognize that Willamette Falls is part of the treaties of 1855. So you have other tribes also accessing eel from those waterfalls, one of our first foods or what some will call Pacific lamprey. It's not a true eel, I guess, but in our native languages, our indigenous languages, uh, uh, we don't make that distinction between eel and lamprey, but for those that um, you're looking at Pacific lamprey or brook lamprey. And uh, this formed in 2011, and we've continued to meet monthly for all of those years. So here we're out at, um, over here, we're digging camas root. Um, first dig um, done every uh, May. A uh, group of indigenous women, some of the students from my classes at Portland State, and we're getting ready. Um, folks were out there today to see how the canvas are doing for a May um, dig. And that's on um, hundreds of acres of a former potato farm in the Tualatin area, Quamish Prairie. Um, this is also Quamish Prairie here in the foreground. We're looking at Thule and Cattail. Um, we're teaching, we're learning, we're sharing multiple generations of indigenous community. We're offering uh, blessings when we come to the land. Um, we have Metro scientists that will uh, often opt to join us. They are learning as we all um, reclaim these spaces. And here we see, um, some of you may know Isabel LaCourse, who's now with Metro, but here she is gathering uh, a big bundle of uh, tule for um, uh, making into traditional mats later. Um, this site, many of you are familiar with, I think. Um, this was the former landfill, 25 acres in Northeast Portland between uh, Killingsworth and 72nd. It officially opened in June, 2018. The native gathering garden, garden is unique. Um, we started with 20,000 square feet. We doubled to 40,000 square feet over the course of conversations that were started back in 2011, 2012. And uh, we now have um, inherited nearly six acres. Let's see, I've got some sites. Oh, uh, community engagement is always critical to everything we do. These were convened conversations. How do we define a native gathering garden? And so I won't read all of these, but you can see um, a number of functions there. Because this is a landfill, it's actually uh, piped underground for the methane gas that's created. And so we will not be doing anything with fire. We won't be doing a uh, salmon bake or uh, anything at this point, according to DEQ, which is one of our partners, until the site is safe and the methane has finished. Um, off gassing. There is adjacent to this site, um, off to the south um, east corner, a methane burning plant that Metro installed um, a number of years ago. This is a construction debris site, meaning um, 
rebar and sheetrock and timber and other things. And so it's slowly, uh, it's been composting since like 1994 and it's slowly um, breaking down. I think it's important to note that the community identifies not just uh, these immediate plants for gathering, a covered area, storytelling, outdoor classroom, but recognizing a place for celebration, ceremony, seasonal relationships, healing the land and people, and looking at reconciliation. We began three years before anything broke ground on this site. These things take a long time. Um, elders advised, let's start with the seed scattering and land blessing ceremony. And so that's what we're doing here. And we had the drums out, we had dancers, um, and we had uh, seeds of native uh, wildflowers donated by uh, Bosky Dell Native Plant Nursery. And um, there's actually a, a 20 minute Vimeo that um, documents the seed scattering and land blessing ceremony that um, folks can access. It's on YouTube that was placed there by Verde um, several years ago, I think, let's build it Kali. And um, I recommend you take a look at that. I knew there wasn't time tonight for us to view it together, but hopefully you can take a look at that. It's the voices of our partners, but it's really steeped in the voices of our, our indigenous, our native community and um, the songs and everything that was offered and talks about what this means to everyone, what this, why this is important. Um, architectural rendering. I don't know how many of you have been out to Cully Park since it opened, but this area here, the southwestern quadrant, and now it extends over here. We don't have the capacity to uh, build this out. We're looking at maybe oak savanna, lots of camas. Um, the membrane underneath this site is limiting. We can't plant big trees but we have planted a lot of um, smaller trees like serviceberry and um, uh, blue elderberry, which is really a shrub and um, uh, crab apple. And there'll come a time where we can add bigger trees. The membrane runs off to the side here down to this kind of gully. And then these bigger trees um, on the periphery were already there, they're not on the membrane. So we have designed this um, based on the weather, prevailing winds, the fact there's very little shade. It's actually elevated because landfills start out pretty high, think of a big heap, and they start breaking down. And so the surface can actually move around a little bit as it composts, which is a challenge when you're putting in these soccer fields other uh, athletic pieces that are scheduled to come in as part of the development of Kali in, in phase two. But this part has been completed and we're now um, looking at next steps. This contouring where we're elevated, ceremonial space in these circles. And here um, we uh, are getting currently from uh, parks, an underground map, it took forever. <laughs> Where are the pipes for the methane gas going over here to this burner, which isn't really uh, architecturally uh, represented, but it's right in here. And so we're finding that. And as we find that, we're looking at beginning to bring in larger trees and create more habitat and shade and wind breaks. So then we can bring in the next, the second and third and fourth tiers. So the native community recognized this isn't just one and we're all done. This is a ongoing transformation from healing and industrially. This is highly industrial, this periphery, highly industrial. Portland airport is right out over here somewhere. You can see Mount St. Helens. Mount Hood is off to our right on this slide. Um, and so every city in the US has landfills and the uh, indigenous community said, let's 
develop a replicable template that can um, perhaps be of value to cities around the country in how they can reclaim this land. And um, it's our responsibility. And so this is a huge test case site. And um, we're very engaged on this site. Um, I don't think I have a current picture in here of everything installed. It doesn't look like that now. So I hope you get out to the site. These are, um, these are um, community, multi multiple generations coming out either through PSU classes or NARA, Native American Rehabilitation Association. People are incorporating um, time on this space as part of the healing journey, whether it's for um, youth um, or whether that's for elders, a, a conventional classroom or people who want to steward, um, people who want to um, um, just come out and learn. So we have our own um, botanic specialist too, uh, indigenous position with Nicole Bruno. It was um, created several years ago. And Nicole oversees programming and projects on site. And she's got a very full calendar, even with COVID safe protocols, a number of um, school groups and other community groups are uh, coming out um, and tending, we, we call it tending, tending the land based on the season, based on what Nicole has identified and community that advises Nicole on what, what we're doing now. And so this is early days, this is all filled in. I, I, I get so excited about the regenerative gifts of our uh, plant relatives and so, uh, this reminds me, I'll get a current shot in this slide presentation. Other projects that we've been doing, the annual salmon celebration at Westmoreland Park, um, this honoring of the return of salmon to Crystal Springs is, um, we're, we're already preparing for our eighth annual this coming October. Uh, last year, it was kind of virtual, but we still had drummers and singers practicing COVID safety and we gathered uh, to sing the Salmon Home this last October. I have to say I was down at Johnson Creek Park in November. I live close by and I heard this slap, 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 slap. And I looked down over that little bridge there if you've been over there and there was a salmon spawning. And so um, it, it's, it's the only unimpeded salmon run in the city of Portland. That's what I've been told. The headwaters come out of uh, Reed Canyon, Crystal Springs, and they also come out of the uh, Crystal Springs Rhododendron Garden Lake area. There's um, apparently more than two dozen of these springs. We've been partnering with BES and parks with the Eastmoreland Golf Course and the Rhododendron Garden on site, the Native community, First Foods people, iTech people, we've been there. They've uh, taken us around on the little golf carts and we're advising on um, some ways that the temperature of that lake can be lowered because it's impacting the um, salmon don't, can't get in there. There's a little barrier, but it does impact the temperature of Crystal Springs um, in which salmon have been spawning now for at least, um, they documented it on the salmon camera, our partner at Reed College, um, at least 12 years. And so uh, we're, we're wanting to redesign and make that work so that um, the temperatures are get, get lowered due to that um, lake. We're also looking at more of our first foods going in like Wapato, Camas, and integrating that into an urban landscape. Yes, it has to be cleaned up. We have to check, monitor for uptake. And we're doing that project uh, out at Quamish Prairie with Metro. And we're doing that uptake and toxicology report 
with the Bureau of Environmental Services Toxicology crew at a five acre site, which I don't have in here, um, we call Shokake, which is a Chinook Wawa um, language for little frog, which is a native frog on this five acre site, again, in the Columbia Slough area on the wetlands. Um, and uh, where we're doing um, uh, toxicology tests to see um, whether it's through touch, inhalation, or ingestion. Those are the three points of contact that toxicologists look at for contamination. And so it's not been done before for indigenous people. And so we're really excited with the work with Rod Strzok at BES and Jennifer Devlin and uh, her crew and our, our native students and uh, Greg Archuleta with the um, Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde who hosted many of our meetings and those of us who've been uh, meeting and then Serena Fast Horse who is the PSU, um, well, uh, an alum, but also currently um, doing a certificate at PSU with post back and working with BES specifically in ITEC, Indigenous Traditional Ecological and Cultural Knowledge. Some of you might, may have seen uh, Serena's presentation in February at the YERC uh, Symposium, the Urban Ecological Restoration Conference. So um, this is just getting started with um, this site, but we meet, we prepare uh, the Bruno family, uh, Clifton Bruno there has, is preparing salmon in a traditional way at Westmoreland Park, open to all people. Um, it's usually just one day in October. We tried doing it in September and the salmon aren't there then. They're there in October. It's like, got to get it right. You can't just kind of uh, um, think, well, it's kind of close. No, salmon are pretty uh, specific. So, um, and then of course, with the opening, we're celebrating um, with uh, tribal representatives. Um, Congressman Earl Blumenauer was there. Um, tribal chairs were there. Uh, mayor was there. We spoke, we offered blessings and um, Army Corps of Engineer was there, their representative and was um, startled and emotional when he said to me, Judy, I." We do these projects all the time. This was a huge collaboration. Some of you are familiar with it to get rid of that old duck pond in Westmoreland Park and uh, restore Crystal Springs. It took out 12 culverts over the years. And he said, we do this work. He said, but uh, I just saw salmon spawning right behind this little stage. He said, it's like they were waiting for us to do the right thing. And we both teared up and I thought, well, I, I never really thought I'd have this conversation with a representative from the US Army Corps of Engineer, but the people inside these institutions um, are changing and they recognize the importance of this work and the connection. And so these are the kind of moments and experiences we're having on the land in the urban landscape. This is Quamish Prairie again. This was another project we did with Metro Oak Quest um, Sequoia Breck there is featured uh, with a traditional digging stick and they um, were part of the team that was inventorying and mapping Oregon White Oak in the Portland metro area. That's Camas Blooming. It's Kelpie Camas Project, that's another project uh, with Sequoia and Savannah Jackson that I worked with and we did uh, Kelpie is the Chinook word for return to or return of Camas. And so uh, this is going on. We'll be having our time out there in a couple of weeks. And those are camas bulbs that have been properly dug and cleaned and prepared. And this is the walk into the site. Uh, we've been on this site for about six years, maybe more. And here we are action site uh, with the traditional pit uh, roasting process. We are adding a series of different plants from sword fern to organ grape to maple and uh, some salal as part fresh plant as part of the uh, 
baking. And you can see in the foreground, we've got a blue pot of potatoes. and There's some onions that we're also gonna throw in with the uh, camas bulbs. The uh, camas bulbs are very starchy. They're a, a, a good quality um, carbohydrate. They are very important first food for many of us in the plateau and Oak Savannah area, the Northwest. And uh, here you can see our next generation uh, over here uh, digging with our traditional cuppin or each tribe has their own word for that, but digging stick. And they have to steam a long time, usually overnight to get tender. I uh, just wanna share a couple of our urban um, Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians have their uh, Portland area tribal office at uh, Southeast 127th and Stark. And um, this is a 1970s business park that had the usual uh, bark dust and non-native landscaping in it forever. And we started partnering with the uh, um, tribe and the elders especially advised us over the years through my classes on indigenous gardens and food justice and traditional ecological healing practices. A lot of my courses are centered in this kind of community engagement work. And uh, here we see uh, our first round of native plants waiting to get into that soil. And so this kind of uh, urban tribal partnership is what we are, um, doing a lot of in this case. Um, this is a learning garden. Um, so let's decided to do signage afterwards in the Athabascan language, knowing that it's a way for those who come to the Portland office, elders and all of the youth programs to um, familiarize tribal members with the language, the plants ID, uh, nibbling, tasting a salmon berry, tasting a thimble berry. Um, we don't have enough planted here to make this a real uh, place to gather for pantry, filling the pantry. Um, but um, they recognize that this is an act of reclaiming. And in fact, I'll tell just a little story um, just a couple of years ago. And I don't have, this is a forest when you come in here. The class was out there back in fall because we're now doing the outer courtyard and working with DePave. We uh, took out asphalt along the parking strip on the sidewalk and planted that with uh, our native strawberries and violets and sedums and uh, <clears throat> ah, one other, I can't think of it. But, uh, but while we were there, we certainly are always learning about the inner courtyard and we're there to take a look at it. It was just this lush garden, uh, taller than the students had some of it. And we took position of the sun, water access, the downspouts that flood sometimes. We took um, what's the capacity for a community to maintain, um, what's the resilience for the plants and uh, to come back and look at it, uh, it's robust. And so the short story is um, uh, the tribal office had arranged to have the building uh, power washed and the keeper of this, uh, all of the land here, um, he said, um, to the people doing the power washing, oh, uh, no oxygen, no, I mean, no oxy fresh or whatever you put in there, no bleach, no nothing. And um, when he came back after they'd done it over the weekend, he came back, these red doors were almost pink and the plants were suffering. And um, what, I, what I appreciate about the story is that the um, manager of facilities who had said, please don't use that. He uh, spoke to the company and had to say, he said, this is sovereign land. This is our sovereignty. This is our identity. You have disrespected it. We asked, it wasn't about just, oh, a miscommunication or, or whatever. It was like, this, this is real. 
And so when we take on uh, community projects together like this, everyone becomes, um, is part of it. There's no bystander. There's no, or we're just doing a project. It's real. It's part of, rec it's part of reclaiming uh, urban space. It's part of reclaiming the urban forest. It's part of saying we are here. And um, this was also programming that Salat's council decided to do at their Salem tribal office and at their Eugene tribal office, because many of the tribal members uh, from some of our tribes in this region are centered along uh, the Willamette Valley where most people are, um, are working or living. And so uh, everyone working, uh, putting the plants in, I really do need to get that shot of the whole garden in there. And um, finally, um, this is just a, a list of some of the projects that we're working on and collaborating. Um, and I'll let you kind of see those. I'll just speak briefly a couple of them. The Bureau of Environmental Services um, with the show cake or little frog wetlands process uh, uh, project. We're looking forward to partnering with um, BES as the city and OMSI and the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission and the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, ATNI, are all meeting on the um, next steps for restoring a riparian edge along the Willamette River on the east side as part of the OMSI property and uh, eventually the creation of the Center for Tribal Nations on that site between the Tillicum Bridge and OMSI. And if you haven't been part of a listening session, um, check it out, check with OMSI or check with um, AT&I or CRITFIC. Um, they've hosted a couple for partners and then they've hosted several for indigenous community and their listening sessions. They're hoping to, this is, a, this is an incredible and PSU Indigenous Nation Studies uh, will be partnering on that. It'll be uh, really exciting. Uh, they're talking about quite a long-term project on the Willamette. Um, oh yes, we participated in a survey with Pacific Lamprey and Steelhead, Johnson Creek. Our, our big project there now has expanded though into the um, Crystal Springs area as we look to work along that to make it a healthy restoration. And I started to say the only unimpeded salmon run because Crystal Springs uh, runs through Westmoreland Park, crosses under Highway 99, and then confluence of Crystal Springs and Johnson Creek happened in Selwood, abutted against industrial area. From there, it flows through Milwaukee and into the Willamette River. There are no dams on the Willamette River at the point. The Willamette River flows into the Columbia. And at that point, there are no dams along the Columbia and they're out to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, we've been documenting that the salmon come back every year for that. Um, and so we're looking at um, uh, long-term partnerships to um, restore and bring ceremony and activities and uh, culturally significant plants to that entire Johnson Creek, Crystal Springs watershed areas that's ongoing. And we partner with parks and BES, especially BES on that. Um, the PSU Oak Savannah Project, creating sacred space and sunsheds in the urban forest. Despite the pandemic, I'm meeting tomorrow on site to um, work with our School of Architecture and uh, indigenous student from Salets who's doing the architecture program. 
we are uh, with the support of the president of the of, of PSU. He has said, let's move this forward. Let's do this. Outdoor learning spaces, uh, reclaiming, bringing back Oak Savannah and um, multiple use spaces. Uh, we're looking at a net zero building or a green building on the little building that's on site, uh, about 1200 square feet. We're gonna visit that tomorrow with uh, several folks from the indigenous communities, students and architecture uh, students team who are focused on this this term only. Um, it's moving very quickly and it would become the center for ITAC at PSU. Um, we're always working with OMSI on different things. Um, that's an old one. <laughs> uh, the ecologically sustainable land management practices within Portland parks. Part of our ITAC is looking at other Portland parks that they're um, they have assessed are not functioning well with a standard conventional green grass, lots of mowing. Um, and so they're reassessing those and bringing back a more sustainable natural flow, bringing in lots of native plants. And we've been advising on culturally significant native plants and other aspects to that. I think it also fits into the uh, recovering the urban forest and expanding it, um, looking at um, long-term habitat as we look at a very dramatically changing climate um, that are less dependent on watering and provide more uh, useful plant um, for our local um, birds, our local animals, um, our local fish and salmon, insects, and, and uh, also people. Um, the First Foods um, Project, we've been working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife at both Tualatin River National Wildlife Refuge and Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge. We were just out on site at Ridgefield last Saturday, again, following um, COVID protocols. Um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, have been uh, long-term supporters of our ITEC with Indigenous Nation Studies Department because of their, uh, our focus, our scope of work is uh, centered on emerging Indigenous leadership, especially around the realms of Indigenous traditional ecological and cultural knowledge and land practices. And, um, I want to just acknowledge the vision of the, the women inside that agency that could see the potential and simply said, what are the barriers for indigenous students in your program and you to sustaining this? And they, they meet that, they do that, they do a lot and uh, they're low key about it. And so um, we've been excited to be on a Tualatin River where they um, brought back the serpentining of Chicken Creek. Now we have to work on a good name for that. But if you've been out to Tualatin River Wildlife Refuge, you probably have been on the site before it got, um, before water was allowed to run in the original creek bed. And it was just in a ditch, as so many of these sites are that we're on, just a ditch at the edge of a, of a rectangle. And so um, part of our work there was, oh, let's guide, let's let the beaver guide us what to do. And the beaver are doing a great job guiding us what to do. So we're getting to work in a co-management way, not just with humans, but with all the other relatives we've always depended on to um, guide us. And so um, it's a very non-hierarchical system. Uh, South Reach, we've done some engagement on that, but um, that's ongoing. And uh, I think ultimately uh, Salmon Planet, International Gathering of Salmon Peoples, we're working on that around the Pacific Rim, but also over to the Sami people in uh, their suffering with climate change. I think some of you may have seen recently their um, 
ice is, uh, normally they get a layer of ice and then snow. They're getting their snow without the ice underneath and it's really throwing off um, a lot of their uh, long-term practices on the land and with uh, reindeer and their food systems, their salmon people as well. So we're kind of excited. We had hosted the Ainu people of Japan a few years ago. They don't have those pictures, but um, they're salmon people and we've danced together and hosted them at the PSU Native American Student and Community Center. And we would like to envision an exchange program where their people can, um, can come and our students can travel there. And uh, we have a lot in common, it's kind of, kind of exciting. So it's a going global with this work. And um, I wanna leave plenty of time and room for any conversation or questions. And so Katsi Yayo, uh, that's uh, thankful to you, thankful for you and your time. And uh, I'll just uh, leave this slide up, but it's kind of representative of all the nature of our work and getting the next generations out and um, building gardens and um, learning gardens and healing gardens. They all turn out to be healing gardens. So, Katsuyo, uh, yeah. And I'm open for questions. Thank you, Judy. Um, so we have um, some questions specific to the schools and the projects early on. What was the name of the K-12 Native American Portland Public School Program? Ah, so um, what that is, is that's a federal entitlement program. And it's called the Office of Indian Education. And it switches right now. It's a Title VI Office of Indian Education. Um, it's been Title V, Title IX, Title VII. And Portland Public Schools has their um, Office of Indian Education headquartered right now at Jefferson High School. And their director is Angie Morrell. I think it's M O R R E L. But if you go within the if you Google uh, uh, Portland Public Schools Indian Education Office or Title VI, um, and so we don't have one school for all the Native, a lot of teachers and principals would think that, but our students are, um, are throughout the district, throughout the neighborhoods. And so all of our programming um, happens after school or on weekends back in the day, I, I no longer work for Portland Public Schools Indian Ed Office. I basically worked for the Federal Indian Education Office, not Portland Public Schools um, and summer programs. And so that slide up here in the upper left going into Tryon Creek is our summer ACE program, arts, culture and um, science. So um, due to gentrification and pressure uh, where at one time many of our uh, Native American families were in the Southeast, Southeast Portland. Um, we have lost, we've gone from being one of the larger school districts with Indian education enrollment of, of Native students K through 12. And um, David Douglas and Park Rose are now where a lot of our Native community have been uh, moved out to. Beaverton School District also has an Office of Indian Education, Title VI, and I believe the head of that is Brandon Culbertson. Thank you. Um, during the Cully Park segment, you mentioned the video, and there's a participant wondering what is the name of the video. If you put in Let's Build It, Let's Build It Cully, it will come up. There's several Let's Build It Cully Vimeos, but um, it's the one where the picture shows people holding hands, almost silhouetted against the sky in a tiny, uh, a little tiny picture. 
And um, when you click on that, it will take you to the um, about 20 minute video that was shot on that. If you have any trouble, um, Renee, I can send you the link. In fact, okay. I could fool around right now, but I don't want to distract what's on the screen, but, and stop sharing my screen and, and, and try and pull up a link to it, but it should be there under uh, Let's Build It Cully Park. Okay, great. Um, so another question about this that project, um, when you're talking about the membrane, is it artificial or natural rock? Oh, no, no. Um, these landfills are uh, membranes, thick membranes. And this one is not state of the art. It was done back in the 90s. And DEQ has explained to us that it's okay, but it's not what they would be doing today if they were doing a landfill and putting a membrane down. No, it's an impenetrable membrane, which is why we can't drive anything into the ground very deep. When we uh, inherited that site, the soil was averaged to be about eight inches thick over the membrane. It's probably synthetic. I'm not sure that it would be an actual rubber membrane, but DEQ probably has some of the um, uh, details on what's on that particular site. Great. Uh, so next question, um, can you suggest some resources for restorative projects on non-public land um, in the city of Portland or on smaller parcels, more cumulative and connective approaches across smaller parcels? Yeah, there is a lot happening on um, non-public land. Um, um, the Celeste project is non-public land. That's private land that the tribe bought there, a 1970s business park in Southeast Portland. Um, we've also done a couple of things on land where nonprofit is, where we've created a edible and medicinal forest garden. Um, um, and uh, but if you're looking at restoring creeks or forest land, um, can they give an example? I mean, are you talking about nature conservancy land that, that's now in trust or what kinds of private land are, are we thinking? Well, um, it doesn't speak to that specifically. I'm not sure if um, the person who asked the question would be willing to put some more details in if we have a chance to get there. Um, we still have a few questions to get through, but we have 15 minutes, so there may be time. Okay. Uh, so we'll maybe perhaps move on for the moment and then come back if we do get more on that one. Okay. Uh, this is a comment from Lorena O'Neill. Thank you for such a beautiful non-hierarchical talk. Uh, I felt as if I was listening to a longtime friend. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, so let's see, we have another question. It's exciting to learn what's going on so far. Thank you. What are the goals of reclamation and research? Well, um, ultimately, most of these lands are held in our public lands. And so, um, expanding our um, access through um, Metro. We're looking at other sites. Um, we're looking at some partnerships with some of the tribes in Montana, looking at food programs. Um, we may partner with them on a big project over in Montana and where their community and students come to PSU and we might send students there they're looking at food security um, and, and on a pretty massive scale um, for growing out um, not only their first foods, but also um, introduced foods like uh, corn. And corn is not introduced from another country. Corn is definitely um, from the so-called Americas, but um, uh, when you get into the central plains and um, you get into corn people there or the southeastern part of the U.S., 
and some of the Northeastern indigenous people, you get into corn people here. We're salmon people here, um, acorn people a little to the south. And so we're looking at resilient food sources. And so partnering with other uh, tribal communities in the Northwest is part of where that expansion is going. And then as I mentioned, well, I didn't mention that. We're looking at uh, working on a certificate in ITAC, a certificate uh, in indigenous traditional ecological and cultural knowledge. And part of what we're um, just this month talking about is learning, using some of what we've learned through the pandemic use of Zoom and looking at perhaps an international certificate where we could be partnering with indigenous people around the globe via Zoom uh, depending on their time, on the time zones, picking out times and doing some global collaborative work on uh, sharing what we're doing here with them sharing there as well. Thank you. Um, so we do have more specifics about the connectivity project. In the meantime, we had a request. If you would please put up the slide, which begins with the word respect and later includes thankfulness. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's a lot of slides. Oh, here we are. Is that the one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So the restoration, the question is restoration of forest on a slope in Southwest Portland on private property. Um, if you mean as indigenous community or in PSU and our indigenous nation studies, ITEC programming, no, we're not working with private. Um, we're uh, not really working with private landowners. Um, no, that's the closest that we did some advising on was part of a grant, a Metro grant for that Oak Quest that I, you saw on an earlier slide. Um, in mapping and inventorying Oregon White Oak, uh, part of what we did put together at the request of uh, Metro and one of our partners um, was kind of a, um, what is what is kind of a native way of knowing, indigenous way of knowing. And we did a workshop for private uh, landowners who happened to have oak on their property. And that was in uh, Clackamas County. That was about um, six, seven years ago. Other than that, I can't think of um, private owners. We're, we're really partnered um, in a way where we can uh, guide and exchange large scale approaches to restoration and land management by these uh, government entities that have thousands of acres in their portfolio. Well, um, depending on the size of the property that this person is speaking about, the Soil and Water Conservation District does work with private landowners. So feel free to reach out to us at info at wmswcd.org. Sure, thank you. I know that uh, Soil and Water District does work and with private landowners, just like Bureau of Environmental Services, um, CWISP program, Community Watershed Stewardship Program, we'll work with um, private landowners for um, ways to uh, either um, protect water quality or prevent runoff or, um, and we, we advise on some of the work that they do, but again, um, um, we're always around to work with the soil and water district, but probably not necessarily one-on-one um, -on -one with landowners. I'm just, we don't have that capacity, but certainly partnering, which I don't think we have much, uh, partnering with East Multnomah, so our, the soil and water conservation districts is something we should look at. I mean, if it's okay, I mean, I've been on a couple of sites with CAMI where we looked at, um, the possibilities of some projects 
on um, one was a parks site, Portland Park site, and the other was, um, I guess it's a private site, NARA, Native American Rehabilitation Association's uh, residential residential site. And so, yeah, we just have to uh, talk about what that might look like. Thanks. Can you please name, uh, provide the name of the Edible Medicinal Forest Garden Project? And are there any links to that? Um, which one? The, which one? They're asking about the name of the Edible Medicinal Forest Garden Project. Oh, we do those everywhere. So uh, <laughs> it's what we're doing on all of, so we're doing them on Showcake, the wetlands five acre site with BES. Um, that's what we did at that um, site with the uh, Siletz Portland area tribal office. That is an edible and medicinal um, garden. And um, the forest aspect comes in in a stage where we start to bring in trees with the, that's always part of it. And so the Native Gathering Gardens is a huge uh, example. We're limited in our, our tree size selection because of that membrane but we've already got that list ready to go. I mean, we've actually planted some alder on site in a small grove where the land was contoured up deep enough that we knew we could plant alder, alder there. And we're getting ready in the fall to do a choke cherry um, grove at the Native Gathering Gardens at Cully. Um, again, on a contoured site where we know we have some depth to put in trees, but these are all edible and medicinal um, urban forests that we're working on. Great, thank you. We have uh, a question asking um, about see, a number of local environmental stewardship programs work with residents to plant trees, create habitat, remove pavement, et cetera, where they live. How might they respectively incorporate TEK into their programs in a non-appropriative way? How might they incorporate what into their? Traditional ecological model. Uh, well, I think um, uh, as, we, as we become more involved with some of these agencies, like I said, CWISP um, through BES, um, that's the kind of thing where we've done some workshops for Metro. We've done, um, we haven't done any workshops for parks or BES. Um, but uh, Metro has had us do a series of workshops and part of that has been for their staff. And um, Sometimes I do it through Portland State University's, um, uh, we do events. And back before COVID, we would do events open to everybody at the Native American Student and Community Center. And this, this is a topic that will come up under um, food sovereignty, or it will come up under a topic of uh, decolonizing, or it will come up as a topic on sustainable land management practices. And lately it's come up as a topic on uh, climate change and resiliency. Um, and so they're all connected. Um, if uh, I think Metro is probably the group that has the most information for the private owner. Um, I mean, back in the day, Metro had their um, Native garden, they still have their native garden and rain garden uh, how to pamphlets. And they used to do um, some of the actual, here's a recommended plant list. When you're looking to integrate the, um, like these principles, um, those are things, um, well, you're at this. So that's one of the ways that 
that information gets shared. Um, conferences, um, some webinars, we've seen a huge increase in webinars being shared across the country and internationally on indigenous uh, first foods. And uh, it's, I've been surprised how much tribes are sharing with, and, and the Intertribal Agriculture Council sounds like ag, but it's more than ag. The Intertribal Timber Council, it's more than just timber. And so there's a lot of research, there are a lot of resources out there for the person who wants to um, get a better understanding. Okay, could you recommend materials or YouTube videos on how indigenous people manage weeds, such as cattails, reed canary grass, et cetera? What I would say Westerners call weeds. Oh, well, we manage cattails by gathering them, making things and eating them. We're always on the lookout for those. We have done a couple of things where people, private owners like on Savi's Island, reached out to us because they have a lot of wapato, but they also use their site for duck hunting, that they charge people to, to do some duck hunting. And so when we went out and waded into the water and we realized, oh, there's tons of shot, <laughs> you know, buckshot in, in there. Um, we weren't sure how is that affecting wapato, but um, people reach out to us um, if they've got a big site. We've had people reach out to us who have large site of camas. We really don't have the capacity to go anywhere because we're not really doing a service. We're, we're more about education and practice and transformative justice. And so um, uh, we've done some tending at Camasia State Park up there in West Lynn. Um, as far as um, resources, um, what was the question again? Resources on what? Um, well, how to manage what we consider weeds. Yeah, uh, we're doing some of that work. We just did a um, attending um, part of um, the work we're doing now whether it's integrated pest management or um, dancing down the grasses, non-native invasive grasses, um, it's, um, and then braiding the grass around each planting like at Tualatin River Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we're, ex we're experimenting on those practices with their staff. So we've been braiding down, flattening after we dance it, down away from, they did a big planting of checker mallow and it was just getting overwhelmed. So just in one class of about 25 people, it was amazing what we were able to uh, knock the grass down with our feet and then start braiding it. And the research so far that we've done at Ridgefield shows that it keeps the seed heads down. It interrupts them going to seed. We've not done this with canary reed grass. So that's what we're working on with BES and their staff, more to come. But um, what we found was the braided, the plates, P-L-A-I-T-S of grass overwintered. They uh, kept any other grasses from growing up. It gave full sun to those plants that needed it like camas, uh, non-competing. It kept the seed heads down instead of the wind catching them and blowing them around. And we found they just uh, composted there. And the whole braid could just be picked up. But uh, it was a way to interrupt their um, reproductive cycle. It was a way to get light to the native plants that needed it. It was a way to visually be able to see the plantings because these grasses were knocked down. And by not pulling them, it didn't trigger a, generate, a regenerative process. And by just braiding them down flat to the ground, um, it's it's something we're, we're it's something we've been doing for a few years, and the feedback so far has been this is interesting. Um, it's very hands-on. It calls for people coming out together and tending. So um, that's why we have big sites like Fish and Wildlife and and Metro. So it's kind of exciting. I don't have a firm answer there on how you can do that. 
Well, I'm glad that that was ended with a bit of a story. We are out of time now. Um, so I want to thank you, Judy, so much for your time and sharing this really important information and knowledge with us. And thank you to all of our participants. Um, we look forward to seeing you at the next Soil School on Tuesday. Have a good night. Katsuya, y'all.